I'm Bria. I'm Sarah. And we're here today to talk about and speculate uh, a murder of all kinds. One that involves a lot of satanic stuff, yeah? Right, triple homicide in Texas. Axe murders, fun stuff, right? Um, head splitting, stomachs bleeding. Lots of drug use, particularly cocaine, maybe some post drugs. So if you're down for the ride, keep watching. So let's talk about this. Yeah, let's talk about a lot of this because there's a lot to be said. A lot to unpack with this murder is just insane. And three separate parts of it, three different sentences or in one case, lack thereof sentencing. Right, I mean, okay, let's just get straight into it. Let's take a drink to this first. Uh, um, cheers. Cheers indeed. Um, sake in our glass. Lots to talk about today and... Okay, so in Laredo, Texas, triple homicide. We both have watched the um, episode. This was on I Am a Killer, a Netflix original series. Um, it's basically about people that are on death row and their thoughts, what they did, how they got on death row. The murders, the crimes, it's gotta be like one of those crime like reenactment shows that everyone watches. But it's another kind of insight because you do get to hear every little bit of their side and they have their entire captive audience that they've been waiting to have to explain how guilty yeah. or how innocent they may or may not be. It's kind of their moment to just speak about it. In some cases, they reveal things that are never talked about in the court, never talked about with the police, or maybe it's all banter that they just want to be infamous for. This is true. And so today we're going to basically dissect and unpack a lot of what we've heard recently. Right. Uh, because both this episode especially intrigued both of us. Um, it's got a lot of satanic influence in it. A lot of controversy as far as um, influential families within poverty-stricken towns. A lot of just complete confusion and, and, and mystific mystification basically as far as how it is so many different sentences can be delved out to so many different people. States and different and, yeah. courts and judges and this is just, it's just a really wild ride. So this welcome to the South, here we go. Um, welcome <laughs> to Texas, which Sarah here is from. Uh, I'm from yeah. Colorado. Um, cool, so in 1991, starting with three friends that apparently knew each other in class, Miguel Angel Martinez, um, Milo Flores, and then Miguel Venegas. They were all under 18, uh, Venegas being the youngest at 16. And the wildest. The craziest. What crazy. Um, mm. Very psychotic, um, as you'll find out, of course. So one night they're doing lots of drugs. Cocaine, Cocaine specifically. Cocaine specifically. You know. Venegas no. does mention earlier that it was also hallucinogens. Oh, that's true. But he also doesn't say whether or not the other two partook in those. I think everyone else basically were like, yeah, we snorted some lines. And that's kind of where that ended was we were smoking a little bit of weed and we snorted some lines. Exactly, right. So maybe he's on a different level. Maybe that's what drove him to be as insane as he was. But sorry, continue. No, you're good. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so they are doing drugs. Um, one of them... I think it's an idea, ponders an idea of stealing something from a house, destroying a house. You know what it was? It was Milo. Um, that was his um, nickname, Miguel Bittis, in which case he basically he, brought up to the other two. He's like, hey, you two are being mooches. Like, no one's pitching in. I'm the only one that buys the cocaine. Yeah, and that's an expensive drug. You know, exactly. we're all aware of that, so. Um, so they start to plan out um, destroying and theft of a house. Uh, Miguel Martinez... Uh, used to work for a gentleman named James Smiley, who is a prominent figure. Is he a gentleman? We don't know that yet. We don't know. He's don't know not. Sure. Probably not. Um, but he is in the church. I think it's Baptist Church. I think right. He's also a restaurant manager. So he's well known, highly devoted to this mass church in Laredo, Texas. So devoted. Devoted. So family man. Oh, yeah. Um, speculation, obviously. Well, actually, all. so interesting. No family, actually. He basically would build his own little um, temporary families, if you will. Uh, he was known to basically take in strays, if you would like to call them that. Children that may have come from, like, lower income households. Right. Or just having trouble. As somewhat of a rescue. Exactly. Yeah. And that's basically how he may or may not, from what we've known so far, have preyed on his victims. Interesting. So... Um, he has keys to this gentleman's house because they had previously done work at some point. 
they whatever that means. Whatever that means. Yeah. That was never went into detail. He's, he's what? He's fourteen. Whenever he's working for him. Which, yeah. I'm sorry. Isn't that against the law? Child labor laws. Right. Mm, yeah. And mm. especially probably under the table. I mean, this is Laredo, Texas. This I don't is know. True? What's the population even? I in don't even Laredo? remember. Honestly, I'm from Victoria, which is just as small, if not a little bit smaller, and like three and a half hours away or so. But, you know, Texas is so comprised. It's such a huge state comprised of so many little tiny poverty-stricken towns that there is so much crime that goes on in such a mass scale that you can't even begin to cover it all. Texas could be its own country. Oh, definitely. Indefinitely. Definitely. Okay, so um, they're forming this plan. They're at Milos's house. Yeah. And they're talking about how they're going to get into the house, what if people are there. Um, so they start to come up with an idea of, like, having weapons as maybe a form of threat that's what it seems to be said from both of them yeah that it's more of a threat than it is something that's actually to going to be used yeah right mm -hmm. um so they go in his um garage carport whatever mm -hmm. they ask for a gun but milos this is alleged from from his father on, on from his father but as yes. well as the other two inmates oh, yeah. have kind of supported and backed this as well which also makes me laugh so apparently Milo initially offered a gun just to intimidate you know beat him around a little bit with it grab his money let's go sort of thing and I feel like he immediately regretted mentioning that to somebody as wild as Venegas is and just went oh I'm sorry my dad locked up our gun so right. offers it, then kind of backsteps a little bit and just goes, oh, hey, but we do have an axe and a bat, which, you know, both can be used as deadly weapons. So no harm there. Let's go intimidate the hell out of this guy and get his money. An axe, a bat, at least two knives. And just some coked out teenagers, you know. Right. Sounds no like biggie. a and great a Thursday night, <laughs> right? Like um, so they make this plan. Uh, Milos drives them, uh, Miguel, both Miguels, which is funny, yeah. Venegas and Martinez. Um, he drives them there. He takes them to uh, James Smiley's house. The fun begins. Um, and this is where they learn that people are home. They're there. More than one. Yes. More than one. <laughs> I don't know if they know all of them yet, but they definitely so. see the person that's sleeping on the couch at that point. And the person on the couch sees them. Right. Yeah. So essentially they make their way into the house. And beforehand, Venegas who is 16 at the time, starts to ponder and really accept the fact in his mind that he needs to kill these people. Oh, I do think he might have a little bit of like drug-induced craze going on yes. after years of cocaine use probably. Years of cocaine, Police possible, genetics. yeah. I mean, who knows what else, you know? Right. Like, and like, I mean, I feel like, have you heard of anyone talking about drugs in any way, especially hallucinogens, L LSD, acid, shrooms, whatever it is, um, they talk about how it kind of opens your mind up, you know? So maybe it opened his mind up in a um, and maybe, less than favorable way. Right, and maybe <laughs> he is just twisted in the head, and there are some people like that. I don't know psychology behind serial killers or killers in general at We're that just deep. true crime fanatics, that's all. Right, we love watching these things. We think they're incredibly interesting. Um, but, so back, back to it. Yes. Um, after he starts reliving almost his um, childhood of believing he's the son of Satan yes. and enters the house with the keys. So this is wasn't a forced entry. People weren't necessarily aware they were even in there. No, I mean, I think this was a late at night sort of situation, you know, and they're, they're coked out. So Middle of the night, yeah. exactly. So um, they first go up to the first of their victims, which was, I'm not sure of actually who it was. They don't name him? Yeah, they don't really give specifics, but he's sleeping on the couch, and Venegas and Martinez are looking at him. Venegas ha is holding the axe in his hand, and he describes the events of him watching this guy sleeping and um, seeing him wake up, look at him, just goes back and to go back to sleep. And that, to him, was the approval Here we go. of the devil that he... <laughs> quote unquote had his back. Which I'm also kind of concerned about because I'm like, so did the devil put him to sleep or did the devil mystify and fog his mind into thinking this was acceptable? There are just so many questions I have specifically for Venegas, basically. I'm like, tell me more about your relationship with Satan, please. Like, the way Venegas goes over his kind of approach to it, his belief about it, is so casual and so... 
accepting of what had it, happened. There's no question. There's no doubt to him at all within his belief in his, I guess you could but just say. But it's not in religion, a, like, you know? insane way. It's yeah. Not in the forefront. not in like <laughs> not in the fact he's not like skittish all over the place no. like freaking no, no. out. He's really contained and reserved. Yeah, and it and seems like he's totally matter of fact to take responsibility for all the things he's done. He's just you know saying, hey, you know, I I did do all these things, but I did it because Satan told me to, and you know he's my dad. So right, like. So, um, he starts with the first murder. After he um, sees the gentleman fall asleep again, he just takes the axe and completely right in the head. Lizzie Borden's him. Yep. Insane. Um, and later on in I Am a Killer, you hear, like, deputies or a medical examiner or something talk about how when that happens... The blood splatter. How real the murder is. It's not simple, like, oh, just an axe in the head... Skull crushing sounds, takes blood. Yeah. It's kind of it's a gruesome scene. And it takes time, you know, and then and power to be able to yes. put an axe mm -hmm. through someone's head. I mean, to we're be not talking like going through the nose bone, two no. pounds of pressure, and you're done. We're talking cracking your cranium. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I assume he died instantly. We can hope. I mean, honestly, I literally hope that he died instantly. The poor guy, I have no idea why he might have been at Smiley's. I don't think anything was ever explained towards that other than just prefacing it by saying Smiley was a seemingly nice guy and not necessarily an actual nice guy. Right. So that was, was the whole there. motive behind even trashing the house, which was Milos, who did not stay. He did leave the premises, drop them off, completely left. No involvement as far as... No sentencing. No sentencing whatsoever. So you have a life sentence, you have a 41-year sentence, and then you have absolutely nothing. And that's whenever I have to say, this is kind of an outrageous case. Um, if anyone has ever watched a single episode of Law & Order, SVU, or CSI, they will know that that man is associate to a crime. He not only provided a murder weapon, murder, sorry, he not only provided a murder weapon, he also drove them and delivered them to the house. You know, I'm not going to say that he's 100% responsible because he's not. Um, free will and whatnot. You can't make somebody do anything. And like I, I said earlier, how you facilitated a crime, whether that be a murder or not. Just, Although I do chest, kind yeah. of feel... I Maybe it's just because I'm a pushover, I have a soft side, but like I'm like, he wasn't involved, like don't bring him in, but like... But and I, I was, totally get that. I get where you're coming from in the whole, and I think we discussed this before, where it's kind of like you know, hate hate the player, not or don't hate the player, hate the game kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, if you are going to compare it, you know, all I can say is like you know, thank God he had an affluent family to help him out to get him out of that charge because pretty sure he might have a life sentence as well at this point. Right. So that's where the point you brought up as far as like prominent figures in this area. Absolutely. Milos's dad was a judge. Okay. Yeah. A judge, a prominent judge, and was still had massive influence. Right? I'm super sure that his daddy had a lot of pull and that he had a little bit more money than both of these boys, considering they were the mooches, per se. And once again, like we've mentioned, you're like, cocaine's not a cheap drug, you know? So if Milo is providing three, like, adolescent males with a ton of coke to keep them so wired that they're about to commit a murder... They've got some money. And right. in the show, and you daddy is just handing it away. Yeah, it seems like they have a ranch, like some property going on too. So there's definitely money in that family as opposed to the other two, which are, you know, probably pretty promised you. So, so um, after that, they stab the man that they've presumably already killed. E um, they stab him multiple times because we have to kill everyone here <laughs> or the devil will kill us. Because Sweet, sounds great. <laughs> because their souls were for the devil, yeah, which is go. something Those that... To the effect of that was said. <laughs> totally makes sense. Got it. Devil's gonna kill me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, he continues to go into the um, first room, which is some man sleeping. Ruben, I believe. I think it was Ruben. Oh, but, they named him. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, so, he has the same axe, chops him in the head, quote unquote, from Venegas, puts it that simply, chop him in the head. Done. Slice and dice, got him. Sorry, bye. Poke time. Oh, you know, like done and done. So he kills him. I don't know if that he really goes into detail if he stabbed him or not. What was going on with that? And just once again, how casual he is about this. I Very accepted. Just got to whack in there with that axe. Now I'm good. Like, well, and 
Okay. Not to be fair, like, not fair, but like to realize the time frame that we're talking about is the crime happened in 91. It's current, the show came out in 2018, relatively t almost 20 years to think about this. And maybe he has accepted it to the point where he's kind of loving the, especially he's getting a show. He's getting a whole episode oh. about it. One more thing about Benet is that Bria has found out from her research, he's escaped from prison. That's right. So after all of this went down, because he got sentenced, we'll get into that in a minute, um, he did escape three years later. Everyone, do you feel safe now? Everyone's feeling great right now with their safety. He is back in prison. Okay, right. there we go. All <laughs> yeah, right. he's back now in I'm prison. Now I'm feeling safe, all right. <laughs> but, um, so anyways, kills the second guy, goes into the second room, third room, whatever it was, and starts without the axe, just starts stabbing. This was the motion I did the other day. Just stabbing um, the guy in the stomach and realizes, Venega says this, I didn't realize it was a kid until he started to wake up as I'm stabbing him. And it's also like, how many random children do you have in your house, Smiley? What is up with this? Why do you a have 14 year old so many underage children in your house right now? Like, I mean, it. I mean, I don't know. There are shelters everywhere. They may not be great places, but at the same time, like, there are shelters you could go to. And I totally understand somebody opting for a, um, you know, a fresh meal, a clean house, a shower over a shelter. Right. But that's also somebody grossly taking advantage of the situation. Smiley, speaking of you. So um, he stabs this 14-year-old kid until he is dead, essentially. Probably um, didn't take very Watches long, him so. die. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> And then from there, um, they steal a TV, a VCR. Um, Who steals a VCR? This is the 90s. I mean, I know it's the 90s, but still, <laughs> even in the 90s, I'm like, of all the things you Go could do. Go to Walmart. Did you, like, want, did you want to grab the microwave on your way out too? Like, what is up? <laughs> sorry. Our shop will take anything. Though. Exactly, and that's what I'm saying. We're I'm in like, Laredo, if Texas. You're, if you're gonna the Walmart's take the VCR, 20 miles that way. <laughs> the pawn shop's right next to it, so go ahead. Like. Um, okay, so. Eventually, three days, three days, I think, go on. I don't know, honestly. Um, and the police go to Milos Flores' house and... Finally talk to him. Finally talk to his dad and... Oh, that's right. They talk to his dad, not him. And ask for an... Don't... Do they ask for the axe specifically? Well, they... They definitely ask where it was, if they had it in the shed. I think they asked to see the shed first to mm -hmm. kind of just overlook and see, you know, what else might be missing? What else could there have been that might have been used and opening up the house or opening up the people in the house, you know, just lots, lots of things to consider as far as right. the police go. So um, they find the axe mm -hmm. and Milo says that he had lent it to two friends to trash a house to someone who seemed good but is presumably bad. Um, Smiley. Correct. Which so, is the worst last name. I'm sorry. I just have it's, Every time I see it and hear it, it makes me dislike it more. And it more. It might as well be a pedophile. It's name. awful. I mean... I just think immediately of like the grossest white man in the world. Go on. Um, so later on, um, I guess they take everyone in. I don't really remember this part as far as that goes. They don't really actually. Um, I will say this show is it's kind of great like, for perspective, but it's not exactly like a timeline of chronological events per se. Right. It's a lot of just random information coming from different parties and then you get to mm -hmm. interpret. <laughs> Especially different people that were involved yes. in the crime. Um, but I will say that there was no people really talking about the victim, James Smiley, or the other two that were extremely close to him, personal. Which is interesting, you know. It was another church goer or a church... Um, attendee. Attendee. That's right. Yeah. What's what are some higher ups in a Baptist church? Oh, I have I no know. idea. I'm uh, familiar with Catholic catechism. There we go. Sorry. No. There, yeah. So I don't know, but um, essentially, court goes on, process them. Essentially, Milos or Milos was completely found innocent from a grand jury. We've talked Crazy. about it. Crazy. Mind blown. But we'll go on from um, there. Sorry. <laughs> and then Miguel Martinez, who was 17 at the time was sentenced to death, which at the time, I actually don't know if it's still, um, still a record, but um, he was the youngest person to ever be sentenced well, on he, death. He was 14, right? Death. 
I think. Is no, he was set 17. Gotcha. Um, Venegas was 16. And since he was under, or 17, under, under 17, 17 is considered the legal age of adult and consent in as far Texas. As the court. Yes, that where normally people would think it was 18, 17, you can probably, you basically hit that line of how vicious is your crime? Can I be trying you as an adult, or can we just go ahead and say, hey, defer adjudication? You know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. So he gets 41 years instead of a death. 41 years. I mean, I think it is. Which is insane. I mean, keep in is mind. Is that three counts of 41, or is that his total? No, that's, that's, his, total. that's his total. And keep With in the mind, possibility of parole. Yes, and you are not going to actually serve out those entire 41 years unless you have a terrible, terrible lawyer and you never appeal ever. Well, if we think about the fact that his parole has come up in 2006, and I think... There you go. But he's not on parole. He's not on parole, they but reviewed, he did And they said that review. his... Uh, yeah, they did review it. It Which was a possibility. Isn't that... I'm sorry, that's insane in itself. Someone who went out, put parole. an axe in someone's head. But 41 years... Homeboy who actually, well, we don't know for sure, but helped facilitate the crime isn't necessarily the most guilty from what we're hearing. Death row? Right. And then number So three. he was put on death row, um, but later on it was commuted to life sentence with the possibility of parole, um, which I think That's is... Wild. I don't know what I, I... I don't know about death row. I don't know about the death penalty. I'm still on the fence if I... Even well, Texas think. does believe in capital punishment. Very much so. So, death row, that's lethal injection, you know? Right. Granted, you're going to spend years, probably decades, before 20. it actually happens. Yeah. You, most you, people, yeah. yeah. You become more of a problem for the rest of the people that are paying taxes than you do... I, I have my own opinions and feelings right. as far as the capital sentence goes, but, mm, well, that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... He gets commuted to life imprisonment, which is kind of where Yay. the show in itself starts off, I guess, yeah. because he was the one on death row. Yeah. Miguel um, Vene- uh, Venegas was never on death row. He only had the 41 years. He Even was, all of his Black Widow spiders are somehow dodging death row every time. I don't understand it. If you oh, watch man. the episode, he goes into detail about the events of when he was eight and how he proved to himself that he was the son of Satan. By, by pouring a jar of uh, Black Widows on himself. And they never bit him, which was his... That's heinously wrong. I'm sorry. Just, <laughs> you're, you're lying to me right now, Miguel. <laughs> Be honest with me, Miguel, please. Um... So, yeah, and that's kind of the murder in itself. Yeah, and I guess what it comes down to is really just beyond all of the other things that are so obviously wrong with what's going on as far as, like, the involvement of Jane Smiley, what he was actually doing with all these random children that he's collecting or housing or whatever. Oh, you we know, never got into that. Yeah, um, and, like, where are these parents at? Also, so, like, essentially, Venegas brings up the fact that This person that was supposedly good but was bad was, quote-unquote, allegedly a pedophile by the community, that there were families to... um, Which, I mean, like, how... Yes, it's still technically alleged, but in my mind, I'm just like, what other explanation is there, really? Right. Because uh, later on in this... um, Miguel Martinez, because they're switching back forth from Mm -hmm. interviewing both of them. Uh, Miguel Martinez actually goes into... And looks somewhat emotional and kind of genuine, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. um, about how he doesn't know about the bad. He doesn't know if he's dealt with it completely and he still has to. And that, to me, seeing that reaction on camera, these weren't cut either. Like, this is like, it seemed real and it seemed to propose that idea and support it. And It seems real and I want to say it's real, but another part of me also just goes, well... There are people who know how to manipulate others so well that they can have that effect on you. The minute that you see and hear their first, their first explanation of how things went down, you know, like you immediately feel for this guy. You feel bad for him. He's very soft spoken. He's very gentle, from what you can tell. Um, you know, you're getting this idea that he must have had a bad childhood, and so you start to develop all of this sympathy for him. But in the back of your mind, you have to question: Should I? I mean, this is somebody that did facilitate a murder. And right. is it worth the revenge, what he might have gone through? Probably so. But we also have no idea whether or not he does have history with Smiley or not. This of could have even just been somebody who didn't even know Smiley that just 
through the grapevine in a small place like Laredo heard what he was up to. Say he might have hurt somebody he knew that he, you know, that he exactly. didn't care for. There's so many ways to go about this. I actually want, just as a curiosity, I'm going to look up the population of Loretto right now because I think that might be an interesting. I mean, I come from 100,000 people in my hometown. So, I okay, I've got do not it. even know what my hometown count is. 200, wow, 244,731. So it's a little bigger. It's like, so it's double the size of Pueblo. That's what it is. That's wild to me because I'm picturing I mean, this really like small rural. Well, I mean, like, it is a border. I was going to say, it's, like, it's a border town. It's not, yeah. it's not a wealthy place. It's not a nice place for sure. I've been there many a time for prescription pills back in the day. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was the 90s. And I'm surprised I never ran into these guys. Just kidding. But either way. Um, no, Laredo is pretty small. It's pretty run down. There is a, there may be a lot of people there, but it's not a very big place, um, which is kind of what Texas is, is you know comprised of. Small places, probably largely spread not apart. Big. Yeah, exactly, and a lot of poverty. A ton of poverty, minus like their major cities. So, hmm. the idea that drugs running rampant throughout this town, absolutely no surprise there. The fact that it's cocaine, not shocked in the least bit. I was a little taken back by the hallucinogenics, but then again, you know, everyone likes to have their fun. So if these are teenage boys, of course they're dabbling, if you will. I have so no idea what the 90s is like as far as drugs go. Like, what is this? I mean... I feel like cocaine has just stayed on I don't throughout know centuries history. now. Oh, yeah. It's just always Cocaine's been popular. Cocaine's been around since the 80s. Or 80s was when it, I yeah. feel like it really hit high. And Regina, like, basically cocaine is the Regina George of the drug world, I feel. You know? That's it. Fair enough. I feel like it's right there with it, you know? So I think the core of like this murder and what it like represents, for me, at least what I take away mm -hmm. from it, and I think you agree, is the short sentence of a 16-year-old that openly admits pleas guilty to these axe murder. heinous or heinous murders that are just two axe murdering people. Like, it's just straight insane. up. That, I mean, no sugarcoating there. He pleads guilty and takes responsibility to axe murder, which is both a little admirable in the sense of like, good for you taking responsibility for the crazy, insane, and terrible things you did. But on the same side, it's like, what has happened to you to make you this way? Right. Which is always the question with any of these crimes. And then that's what I think the point of the show is to like facilitate you to look at this mm -hmm. individual. Who is never going to see the light of day again? No. Who is never going to, you know, be around people Probably that aren't in civilization in anymore? You know? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Sarah earlier um, how these people have insight to life in such a vastly different yes. way, and the way that they view it, and and the judicial system. I mean, how can you not say somebody has so much insight to that? Because whenever you have three different sentences carried out, two of them for the same crime. Possibly. Right. And one for somebody that's clearly an associate to the murder that had every opportunity to warn somebody or to tell the police and even even just tell his dad, you know, and did not. So who's the most guilty here? That's up you know, that's up to interpretation that's, for everybody, exactly. I think. Yeah. You have to interpret it and everyone's gonna have their own say. If we were all in a grand jury and we all had that opportunity. We'd be a hung jury right now, huh? <laughs> We would be in deliberation for quite some time. Well, it's just, you know, it's sad. The whole chain of events is sad. Um, unfortunately, I do I do wish they spoke more on Smiley and let us know more about what they may have found right. out. And it almost makes me wonder, with the idea that there's not much to be found on him, I don't know how much research you did, but I, I didn't see anything online, which makes me kind of shrug and go, well, isn't that so nice for him that somebody that might have been a really corrupt, terrible person within his life has no record of it, and because he's now dead and been murdered horrifically, no one's ever going to know. No one will ever have him take responsibility for the shit that he's done, which is awful. And then I mentioned this to Bria as well, um, and you'll see within the episode if you choose to watch it, Miguel at some point whenever he's interviewed, um, Mendoza this, does look a little surprised whenever cameramen tell him the sentence of his uh, fellow, I guess, co-conspirator in this murder. Um, it seems as if it might have been oh, the yeah. first time of him finding out that he's the this. only one that's been sentenced to life in prison. I gotta go back and watch that. And it's a little specific. heartbreaking. Yeah, it's sad, man. Like, you see it in his face, and like like you said, he's a... We have to... But that Miguel Martinez is so well-spoken, so... It yes. seems... So vastly composed. Composed, different, intelligent, like someone that... And Not I, anyone that you would... If I ran into... Is that a sign? Maybe, yeah, sure. Because, I mean, you think about all these crazy serial killers... Ted Bundy, specifically, totally charming. 
totally they're charming. always charming they get people to like them manipulative as hell but it happens that way and so that's you know where i kind of stand on mego as well where i'm kind of like you know you're not somebody that i would shuffle away from in line you're not right. somebody that i would like dodge walking across the street you seem like somebody that's pretty trustworthy and pretty calm so isn't that more dangerous than anything else all right, well, I think that's kind of all we have to say about so that. We, so we talked you, your ears off, yeah? Are, we, Are you feeling good? Are you safe? Are you no. interested at least? No, you're not safe. Please huh? lock your door. Um, unlike me, I never lock my door. That's um, great. Perfect. Well, if we end up posting this online, thank you for watching, if you are. And... Let us know if you want us to do this again. Because we And will. a big shout out to Mitchell. Mitchell, what's up? Um, he set up an amazing everything. camera. Glowing everything. Glowing like angels lighting. because of him. Life changing. It's great. Perfect. All right, well, Let's go enjoy bye. this sake and cheese. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. There will be blood. Run for your life.